from Thomas Edison State University. This is Edison Soundstage. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Joseph Youngblood II, and I am the Vice Provost and Founding Dean of the John S. Watson School of Public Service here at Thomas Edison State University. It is my extreme pleasure to welcome you to the latest installment of the Public Service Leadership Studio on the Edison Soundstage. We have the privilege this morning of hosting two phenomenal healthcare executives to discuss this morning's topic, the short, medium, and long-term implications of COVID-19 on the financial health and well-being of hospitals and the American healthcare system. Joining us this morning, I am pleased to say that we have Dan Moen and Michelle Morrison. Dan is the president and CEO of St. Francis Medical System uh, in Trenton, uh, which is a part uh, in one of the regional health ministries of Trinity Health, uh, the second largest Catholic healthcare system in the country. Michelle is the chief hospital executive for Southern Ocean Medical Center, a medical center in Hackensack Meridian Health, which happens to be uh, the largest and the most comprehensive uh, health system in the state of New Jersey. So two very extraordinary people with wonderful and deep backgrounds, both in terms of uh, their role in their transition in healthcare uh, into leadership. And uh, I'm certain that uh, both can sort of talk about that in their opening statements. Uh, in full journalistic disclosure, however, uh, I think I would be remiss if I did not share that in addition to uh, both Dan and Michelle being dynamic, informative healthcare executives, uh, that both Dan and Michelle have really important uh, and interesting ties to Thomas Edison State University and also to me uh, personally and professionally. Uh, Michelle is a proud alumna of the Thomas Edison State University and actually one of the inaugural graduates of the Watson School of Public Service. So Michelle, in many ways, that means that you and I are inextricably linked in terms of our professional <laughs> identities forever. Yes, so, we are. Continue to watch your growth, your development from the time that you were a student uh, until your ascension to your current role in healthcare. Uh, we really value you, appreciate you, and it's always great uh, to have one of our former students and one of our alums uh, to engage in this kind of uh, activity. Uh, I also have the privilege, uh, the unique privilege and pleasure of serving with, I think, one of the most dynamic healthcare executives uh, that I've had the opportunity to work with. Uh, as a member of the St. Francis Medical Center Board uh, and also as its current board chair. Uh, Dan and I uh, work together and uh, my colleagues on the board and I try to support him and all of the work that our tremendous colleagues are doing uh, to provide quality health care uh, to the citizens uh, of Trenton and frankly anyone who shows up at our door. So Dan, Michelle, welcome to the studio. Thank Great to be here with you. So let's jump right into the discussion. And as an additional framing and context for your opening statements, I wanted to throw out what I thought was a mind boggling headline from a July 2020 Kaufman and Hall report to the American Hospital Association. And the tagline of the release stated, and I quote, without further government support, over one half of all hospitals in America may be operating in the red in the second half of 2020, jeopardizing community care. Dan, Michelle, what are your reactions to that? And uh, what are your opening thoughts on our topic this morning? Michelle, you want to open or would you like me to do that? Go right ahead, Dan. All right, thanks. Uh, first of all, it's uh, great to be here with all of you and, uh, and uh, great to meet Michelle. And I just want to say, uh, Dr. Youngblood is understating his impact on uh, St. Francis Medical Center. He is a, a tremendous board chair. Uh, you know, these volunteer positions, which eat up uh, major parts of their schedule and calendar, um, you know, he just does an amazing job as the board chair. And I want to uh, let everyone know uh, how grateful we are to have his expertise and his talent uh, at work in Trenton uh, and beyond. You know, as far as you know, the the pandemic surge that we experience. And, and I've been a hospital and health system CEO for over 30 years. I've ne I had never seen anything like it. Um, this was, uh, there was no playbook, you know, for a pandemic surge in New Jersey. We only have about 4% of the nation's population, but we were experiencing 10% of the cases across the country and 10% of the deaths uh, from COVID-19. So uh, dramatic impact on hospitals. Uh, we had to, um, 
stop all elective uh, procedures, all non-emergency surgeries, uh, physician visits, um, imaging procedures, et cetera. You can imagine what kind of an impact that had on this institution, on Trinity Health, and on all institutions across the country um, as, the, as the pandemic hit. But thank God we did that. Thank God we shut down when we did because we would have been totally overwhelmed without that. We would have been New York City uh, plus, and, uh, and that would have been something that overwhelmed the healthcare system in New Jersey. But the shutdown uh, enabled us to stay ahead of the wave, but it was, it was daunting. It was uh, highly stressful. Uh, we here at St. Francis had two thirds of our patients COVID positive on the inpatient side. Uh, at one point, and these were very sick patients, ventilators, BiPAPs, uh, highly um, you know, uh, unstable patients, nursing staff jumping in and out of rooms and full PPE. Um, it was amazing to watch the team here. I can't tell you how grateful I am for the work that everyone did here at St. Francis and I know in other hospitals across the system as well. We had our own incident command team. Trinity Health had its own incident command team. Uh, every day, we were uh, seven days a week, we were uh, uh, coordinating our effort uh, on the pandemic. And uh, again, just can't say enough for the, pe for the people who were in those rooms doing that care every day. Uh, when I was up on the, in the ICU and I saw patients on ventilators and being prone, you know, turned over so they could, they could uh, uh, breathe better, uh, just the team that was in there was amazing. We, we're a teaching institution. We have 30 internal medicine residents. We would have been lost without them. They did just an incredible job uh, in unprecedented times, no question about that. Um, so at the peak, we were losing about three to three and a half million dollars a month here at St. Francis from shutting down all of those procedures. Um, we've done a reopening that has been successful. Uh, however, uh, that volume has not returned to pre-pandemic levels and we can talk about that a little bit further on. And, uh, and the thing we fear at this point, obviously, is a research. Uh, in the fall, with people being driven indoors in colder weather, uh, people getting uh, fatigued, if you will, mask fatigue, I call it, but masking is one of the most important things we can do, social distancing. You, know, you hear about some of the big uh, party gatherings that occur out there uh, uh, in the area at, at times here. And, um, and we've got to avoid that. We've got to encourage everybody to keep uh, their, uh, their behaviors um, in place and moving forward, uh, this is this virus is going to be with us for a period of time. It's not going away uh, anytime soon. Even if we have a vaccine, we're going to be practicing, um, you know, these these good behaviors going forward. And the only thing I could say is that, uh, and we'll talk about this some more. But you know, the CARES money from the federal government, uh, which we got as being a hotspot institution here in uh, New Jersey, kind of saved us financially. Um, and without that money. Uh, we'd really be in trouble uh, as far as our losses are concerned. But that was one-time money. It's not coming again. And uh, we're going to have to deal with this, uh, this short, medium, long-term situation we're going to uh, talk about further uh, on here in the, uh, in the, in the podcast. So, uh, so that's my opening statement and looking forward to more of the discussion. Thank you, Dan. Michelle. Sure, thank you. To echo some of what Dan said, certainly this was the largest pandemic of our entire lives and hopefully will be the only pandemic that we'll be facing any time in the years forthcoming. The impact is huge. As, as Dan said, we had to stop bringing patients in for elective surgeries. Certainly that has an impact on us financially, but it also has a huge impact on our patients and our communities where each of our hospitals lie. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about that as we continue over the next hour. The CARES Act certainly provided a stopgap for us and all hospitals across the entire state and probably across the nation have really worked to strategize and reboot business plans. I think what's important for communities to know is you're probably safer coming to a hospital because of the processes and the structure we have in place to ensure a safe environment that's clean and healthy for everyone, our team members, our patients, our visitors, and anyone who enters our doors. It's definitely safer to come here than it is to go to your local grocery store because of the processes and the requirements that we have with our state licensing agencies to provide that environment. Having said that, the amount of money that we've all spent to ensure safety 
is just tremendous. I, I agree that we've lost a couple of million dollars every month during the time that we were closed. Luckily here, we're located in a very short community. So our volume between Memorial Day and Labor Day usually quadruples here at Southern Ocean Medical Center. We really did not see that this summer. We still had a lot of people come here to the Jersey Shore. My hospital is about seven miles from the ocean. So we're on the mainland here uh, to Long Beach Island. And despite having a huge population that did come down during the summer months, we really didn't see the volume that we normally see. Luckily, when we were able to go live again with elective surgeries, we are really close to what our budget is, about 95 to 98% of that volume has returned. However, you also have to keep in mind that we weren't doing elective surgeries for two to three months during that time. And some of that is that pent up volume. So it will be interesting as we get to the last quarter of the year, whether our surgical volume and our inpatient volume remains strong. Luckily, as COVID has continued, I think our inpatient volumes across the state have certainly declined. We are continuing to see positive cases. Luckily, here at Southern Ocean Medical Center, we cover anywhere from one to four cases of inpatients, and our severity of illness has definitely declined. It was a really stressful time from March until May for us as healthcare providers and definitely for our staff, our frontline team members, whether they were clinical or non-clinical, to be part of having to work during this pandemic. You can imagine the stress and the courage that it took for each and every one of them every day to come into work. We too had our command center open locally, seven days a week, 24 hours a day for more than three and a half months. We being part of a very large health network that includes 18 hospitals, many long-term care facilities and others. We also had our network command center open for that duration of time. It not only was physically exhausting, but mentally exhausting. And I think we'll continue to see some of the overflow of that with our team members as we, as we continue our journey. Hey, Michelle, one, uh, one thing, uh, you know, it's it's interesting point, you know, for example, our cardiovascular services, we have a very sophisticated uh, cardiac surgery, cardiovascular system, uh, you know, and, and service line here. Um, and that volume has come back pretty strong. Um, and I and I think, you know, that's that sort of pent up demand uh, that you saw uh, in your in your organization. Uh, but it's interesting for the emergency room. You know, in the you know very busy emergency room, thirty thousand visits, and uh, and we saw that volume go down during the surge, um, and that has not come back. It, it's sort of patients, you know. I think in some instances they're afraid to come back. They think hospitals are places where you know COVID is rampant. That's not the case. You're right. This is a very safe environment right now. We've gone from having over fifty COVID positive patients on a day to some days where it's zero, and, and today it's two. So uh, again, uh, it, and we're much better, at, we know more about treating patients now as well. The anti-inflammatories, the anticoagulants, those sorts of things. We're preventing patients from getting to that stage of being on ventilators and not being able to make it long-term. So it's gonna be interesting to see whether this volume ever returns or whether people are gonna resort to other uh, uh, types of care such as telehealth. And we're very involved in the telehealth side as well. That sort of uh, ballooned over the course of the surge as we attempted to deliver care, um, but keep doing it in the safest way possible. So I, I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Absolutely, Dan. We too, as a healthcare provider, have moved largely to telemedicine visits. And I do think that will be the future of healthcare in any ability to do telehealth, I think will continue for the foreseeable future as people are afraid to return and we continue to try to maintain distancing as best we can. Our emergency department across our entire network of 18 hospitals has not been at budget. Here at Southern Ocean, we've been pretty close to that over the last month at about 90% to our budget and we see upwards of about 38,000 visits a year. But across our entire network, we're only at about 75%. Some of our northernmost hospitals in Passaic and Bergen counties, 
right outside New York City were really, really inundated almost to the same capacity that New York City was when, when we really were in the height of COVID. At any given point during that first two months, March and April, we had more than 2,000 patients hospitalized in, our, in one of our 18 hospitals. And almost half of those, about 800 of them, were critical care patients, many of which were on ventilators, just as you point out. So I do think we've learned a lot about how to treat COVID, how to treat them medically, prevention, the use of universal masking. And I think our governor in New Jersey's approach to being extremely conservative. So as you point out, we really don't know what the next few months will bring. The weather, of course, has been uh, unusually chilly for mid-September and it will be interesting to see as schools have reopened and some colleges across the country what that means and what we'll continue to see as we drive people indoors and you know holidays approach and people are are getting fatigued of not being able to get together with their family their close friends and really miss seeing each other we know across New Jersey and across the country, the impact of COVID has also played a huge part in mental health, depression. We've seen a huge influx of that across the entire state. I'm sure it's the same for Dan in his, in his hospital and certainly here in mine. And you all raised some really uh, interesting and insightful points. And I wanna add that uh, one of the fortunate and certainly in the short term, unfortunate realities of COVID-19 is that it exposed um, quite a few vulnerabilities and fragilities in the American healthcare system that I think we were just not prepared uh, to acknowledge or understand because we had never dealt with a public health crisis like this, uh, at least in the last century. So when you look at things like the supply chain management challenges, that meant that our colleagues did not have the PPE that they needed to maintain uh, the health quality standards that we want to make sure that we're providing both to our colleagues and to patients who are coming to the hospitals. Uh, when you look at the challenges that we had in terms of the staffing ratios because of the uh, early testing uh, faux pas that we had that did not allow, uh, certainly in a hospital the size of St. Francis, uh, to really uh, cycle people on a 14-day uh, kind of uh, period uh, while we were trying to determine whether or not they were positive, et cetera. Can you talk about what these implications represent for the future of healthcare? Uh, both of you have the benefits of being affiliated with really large systems with a lot of resources. That's not the case for many hospitals in America. Mm -hmm. So what have you learned and what can you tell us about the business model of healthcare in America and what the implications are gonna be for us post COVID? Uh, another sort of illustrative example in terms of something we can dig into is this understanding of, is there going to require another shift and how we look at delivery systems and models. Uh, I see that we transitioned from uh, an understanding of the importance and the role of acute care uh, to a more ambulatory model. In places like Florida, where they didn't have the beds to manage COVID, it was a huge issue. So what, what are some of the implications there? And we'll start with you, Michelle. Sure, thank you. So there certainly continues to be implications. The supply chain was a huge issue across the entire country being able to provide PPE, universal masking for our team, N95 masks, right? We continue to see shortages of that, as well as the financial implication because we used to be able to purchase those supplies very inexpensively while they were still being manufactured, the costs were really triple of what we would have normally paid. So it did create a lot of uncertainty, some safety concerns, at my hospital, we were really lucky to be part of a huge network. So we did have the financial resources to be able to provide those measures. And I think it was a time where healthcare, regardless of being independent or part of a system, really came together as one. The state of New Jersey really did a very good job with their reserves, their stockpiles, um, providing ventilators to hospitals when necessary. And I know for me, I am at the southernmost part of, I'm the southernmost hospital in my uh, health system. And I had CEOs from hospitals that are not part of my system reach out to me and say, listen, I've got 50 extra ventilators. If there comes a time where you need them, please don't, don't hesitate to reach out. 
We did receive ventilators from the federal stockpile for a short period of time. And as an organization, Hackensack Meridian Health has really done a remarkable job preparing for any type of a resurgence. We have prepared a COVID 2.0 playbook. It has more than 30 chapters in that. And I would say that we, we have a really good structure and process and handle on what we need to do should we see a resurgence. There are many models out there from the CDC, the World Health Organization, and from the state looking at what we can expect for a resurgence of COVID should we have one. And our ability to transfer patients, field hospitals, the support that we had with field hospitals was another support that the state provided. And having the ability to be part of a large health network gave us the ability to transfer patients within our own system. So here at Southern Ocean, we have 176 licensed beds. Our, at our highest, we had over 60 COVID patients with about 20 or 30 other patients. So we were easily able to accept patients from one of our sister campuses at Palisades Medical Center where we took 26 transfers from them so that patients weren't waiting in their emergency department for the, the care and treatment um, that wouldn't be optimal being rendered in an emergency department. So we were easily able to take care of those patients here. And that was at a time where we also weren't able to have visitors to see our patients. So that also created, I think, an extra burden on our staff in making sure patients didn't die alone, that we were communicating with families. As we look forward to the future, the one area of concern I have is really around the ability to do testing. At the start of COVID, we were at times waiting three or four days to get those test results back. Urgent care centers were waiting five to seven days to get those test results back. While we have some capability to do testing that provides rapid results, it's the purchasing and manufacturing of reagents that is sometimes the limiting factor for that. We're testing every inpatient that gets admitted to the hospital. So you're testing far more people the counties individually put together drive-through clinics. You know, we supported that, the, new, the uh, Ocean County hospitals, there's four of us, and we don't all belong to the same health system, but we each sent nurses to the Ocean County drive-through clinic to be able to keep patients out of hospitals for testing, being able to provide an additional resource. So I do think that the challenge will be, if we have a resurgence, our ability to continue providing care, elective procedures, outpatient studies, again, because the implications to patients in our communities could have a huge impact on their overall health, which we wouldn't want to see for the future. During COVID, we used to sit here and say, well, where are those heart attacks? Are people not having them? Of course they are. They're having chest pain. They're having numbness and tingling. That's probably the precursor to having a stroke. And they're not coming in for care because of fear. So we really want to make sure moving forward, should we see a resurgence, that patients don't put off getting the necessary health care. I think telemedicine is a huge opportunity for care to be provided at some level and then sending those patients that require emergent care to hospitals. Thank you. And, and Dan, I want to pose a uh, specific question uh, to you and Michelle. Uh, also uh, jump in because I think there are certainly uh, demographic characteristics that are specific to your region uh, of uh, the state relative to the issue I want to bring out. One of the other uh, unfortunate realities, um, particularly as uh, healthcare and public health officials pay more attention to population health related issues, uh, specifically around our understanding now of the direct link uh, between social determinants of health and the health and well-being of communities. Uh, COVID exposed again that there are extraordinary health disparities that exist uh, for communities of color and low access communities where there are also people uh, in vulnerable populations such as the poor. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that again, um, I think we're concerned about uh, are how do we address these um, disparities? and what that represents in terms of uh, issues like COVID and issues of access and quality of care. Uh, so Dan, you happen to um, lead a facility that is 
um, the only comprehensive uh, acute uh, urban safety net hospital in the city of Trenton. What were your experiences doing COVID and how does that translate into how we need to think about these issues of quality and access of care, uh, particularly for communities of color and poor people? Yeah, you've hit on a big, uh, on a big issue, Joe, and you know, and you see in the numbers, not only here in New Jersey, but across the country, uh, COVID-19 has had a very disparate impact on, on people of color. Um, you see uh, the, uh, the rate of, uh, of cases, uh, you see the outcomes uh, as being uh, less positive. Uh, so all the inequities and disparities that you know, existed in the system pre-pandemic were just uh, magnified enormously in the, um, you know, uh, during the surge. You know, and, you know, many people, you know, who are in essential positions uh, in the community had to go to work, could not do their job, you know, uh, remotely. Um, you know, a lot of those positions are held by people of color in this community. And so they were out there exposed uh, and more at risk. Uh, then they're going back to uh, homes in the community where, uh, you know, transmission of the virus could occur and, and uh, again, uh, be uh, brought uh, out into other areas of the community. So, so you know, We've been here for almost 150 years serving the community at Trent. Um, our mission is, uh, is incredibly strong here. Uh, we certainly care for everyone. Care for those who are poor is a particular uh, uh, value that we hold uh, here at St. Francis Medical Center. Uh, but yes, we saw the cracks in the healthcare system and how people fall into those cracks. Um, so it's access to care. It's, uh, it's access to medications. It's the ability to protect oneself out in the community uh, when going out for necessary work or necessary, uh, or necessary supplies. Um, we've got to do a better job at this. There, there is no question about that. Uh, access to primary care in the city of Trenton uh, continues to be a, an issue. Um, you know, the, uh, the issues around behavioral health, uh, mental health services, substance abuse, uh, we're seeing those, uh, you know, uh, magnified by the COVID-19 pandemic as well. So we've got to have a system in place that helps people navigate the services that we need. And unfortunately, I don't think, you know, anybody across the country is doing a great job at that. We've got to do a better job of helping people access services uh, to be able to uh, um, continue those services when necessary. Uh, obviously, universal health coverage is a big issue, and uh, we're seeing, you know, threats to that at this point, which would further exacerbate the health care inequities uh, that we have out there. We've, uh, we've got to do something different in this country as far as these health care inequities are concerned. Uh, you know, I come from the state of Massachusetts where we were able to achieve about 98 percent coverage for health insurance in the state through health care reform, including expansion of public options, um, and, uh, and, uh, and private uh, options as well. Uh, you know, in my mind, we're gonna continue to have inequities and disparities as long as people do not have access to coverage, and as long as they do not have access, easy access to primary care. And so those are the kind of the baselines that I see that will help solve some of the issues on the disparity side, but not all of them. Thank you, Dan. Any perspective, uh, Michelle, from uh, your vantage point? The only addition I would um, include is the knowledge of that patient population for what they do need to do. Preventative health care is just a large part of that. So it is access, it is financial ability, primary care, and educating those individuals and those large groups on the need to have preventative care and prevention of, you know, extreme illness and COVID-19 was a good measure of that because they did not have the knowledge and and that was largely the patients as Dan said that did not do well. No, Dr. thank Young, you. But, yes. Dr. Young, but I also wanted to comment for a minute just back on the uh, the, the whole issue of uh, the structure of systems that sort of thing. Um, if St. Francis was not part of a big healthcare system, Trinity Health, we would have been dead in the water. Uh, we really received so much help from the system um, as far as PPE is concerned and transferring PPE around the country within the system from areas that did not have a surge to those that did have a surge. 
Um, at one point, you know, my critical care area in the hospital, one of the critical care areas in the hospital we had move, uh, operating, uh, the night shift was basically mostly staffed by highly talented critical care nurses from Idaho, um, from our, uh, our uh, ministry at uh, St. Alphonsus in, in Idaho. Uh, again, we, we were able to give people a break, you know, you give them, let them recharge a little bit because uh, we were burning people, you know, Right to the very, right to the very end of their capabilities, because there was so much going on. The care was so intense. So uh, I see, uh, you know, as a, I see standalone hospitals moving even, you know, further into systems or having that happen more rapidly, um, and I also see, uh, you know, these ambulatory models being developed uh, in a way that we haven't seen up to this point. And again, um, I'm worried about safety at hospitals in particular. Um, because we were, you know, safety in the hospital was not in great shape financially, you know, pre-pandemic. And I also worry about not so much for New Jersey, but across the country, rural hospitals. Right. You know, these little 25 bed critical access hospitals are the only provider for 50 miles around. Um, you know, many of those, those, those have been falling, you know, like dominoes for a period of time. And I think that may accelerate as well. So that's a bigger system-wide issue that we're going to need to address in this country. Absolutely. And I think we saw the benefit of systemness, uh, but we also saw the benefit in New Jersey of systems thinking. Uh, and we had the wonderful benefit, as Michelle mentioned, of a governor that has really shown extraordinary leadership, not just in what was happening here in New Jersey, but in shaping the discourse nationally. But here in New Jersey, we also had the wonderful benefit of a commissioner of health uh, who understands every aspect of health care. Uh, as someone who started as a nurse uh, in a local community hospital and worked herself up to be the CEO of one of the largest health systems uh, in America, that insight in terms of how she and her colleagues at the Department of Health, I think, supported the on-the-ground work uh, to build infrastructure where there was none and to make sure that we were leveraging all of our state's resources to providing um, assets uh, during this most critical period was also essential. So we saw certainly the exposure of some of the gaps in our system. We saw, again, the fragility and the vulnerabilities within the system. As Dan said, metaphorically, there were many cracks. But boy, did we see the system and our healthcare systems respond in terms of a level of resilience that I think we could only harness and see here in America the way our healthcare system and our wonderful colleagues have responded. So with that, and as a closing, um, uh, as an introduction to your closing uh, statements, uh, can you just give one example uh, of that level of resiliency that you saw either within your organization from individual colleagues on the front line who literally were sacrificing their lives to make sure that people were supported and served? Can we sort of close out with that? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm happy to go first. And I'm a nurse by training. And I have never been more proud to be a healthcare provider than I have been in the last six months. The amount of resilience of our team members at every level of the organization is beyond what you can even imagine unless you were here living it every day. Adopting a model of no patient dies alone, you can imagine how stressful that is as patients were unable to have their family members here. And our team members just saw the severity of illness growing day by day. It was so difficult for them emotionally. They still got up and came to work every day. They created friends. I, we, we talk here about the silver lining to the pandemic. And one of those is the relationships, the collaboration and the compassion not only that we were able to render to our patients, but to each other in a way that we have never ever seen before. We and, and most healthcare organizations really honored their healthcare heroes. We had parades from the police and the fire around the campus a number of times. The community outreach from local restaurants and community members delivering food our ability to just have hydration stations where we had water available and protein bars, because as you could imagine, wearing the amount of PPE and N95 masks created additional 
baggage for our team members, you know, that physical part of being so warm and rendering care, feeling like at times that you couldn't breathe yourself because you're wearing an N95, you're wearing a surgical mask on top of that, you're wearing scrubs, you're wearing a gown, a plastic gown to protect yourself. It was remarkable to see. Here at Southern Ocean, one of the things that we did is we celebrated our discharges because it gave our team the ability to line up in the hallway and say, we saved another patient. They're going home. They're going to rehab. They spent 40 days on a ventilator. And so we would announce it overhead. Please join us for a discharge celebration. We would line the hall. We would play Here Comes the Sun by the Beatles overhead. And the emotion that was exhibited during that time, not only for our team, but for our patients. We also, our emergency department, you know, as every patient entered was kind of the hub of, of what was happening. And our emergency department here decided to do a video that was a pit bull video for one of his newest songs. And it was a song about the virus and about being resilient and about being strong. And it was featured in his music video. It was featured on Good Morning America. It was featured on many of the news stations. And it was our way of bringing our teams together to celebrate them, the hard work that they did. And I will say that I am grateful to be part of a huge healthcare organization because even now, as we're really past the acute part of the pandemic, but have some fear because we don't know what the future will hold. And we do worry about our team. And we have a lot of programs in place to support them locally and through our network because the mental health of our team is also needs to be at the forefront of what we're using and preparing for in the upcoming months. So again, the compassion and the collaboration and just the caring for each other was really for us at Southern Ocean Medical Center, the silver lining to what I could say this pandemic has brought to us. Wow, thank you, Michelle. Dan. Oh, that's, uh, that's a, a great story and, uh, and one uh, that's similar to what happened here at St. Francis. Um, I'm a radiologic technologist by background. I can tell you if uh, my license was active, I would have been doing portable x-rays, uh, you know, with, uh, with the team. Um, and uh, I will give you a quick story, and it involves the radiology department. So uh, as you can imagine, uh, the rad techs were also jumping in and out of PPE, going in and doing portable x-rays in the ICU, come out like sweating, and you can't believe, uh, you know, because of the, of the PPE. Well, uh, there was a, there was a pay, we had two staff in, two rad techs in doing a, a portable x-ray on a patient who uh, coded uh, at that moment. Um, and they were, they needed to initiate CPR at that point because no one else, I mean, everywhere, there were critically ill patients all over the place. So, uh, you know, people have, would have to gown and go in. They had to run that code themselves basically for a period of time. And they just did an amazing job and the patient actually did, did, did well. Um, but boy, talk about, uh, you know, doing whatever needs to be done uh, to help in a, in a patient situation. I'm, I'm, and again, that's just a small example of the of the care and the uh, and the dedication that was exhibited by the by the team here. Um, you know, the other thing that was important, and Michelle mentioned this earlier, was uh, you know the the team not only was trying to take care of people from a, a clinical and a technical point of view, they were trying. They became the patient's family, and they were the link to the patient's family and friends. We. Uh, at Trinity Health initiated iPad communication system for patients across the system. So that was a small way to link people in a situation where, you know, they were alone uh, in, and alone in a very difficult you know, a circumstance, not knowing what their outcome was going to be, not being able to see family members. Um, and again, I just those little acts of kindness, holding someone's hand, uh, reaching out and making sure you continue to communicate with the patient, even when they're sedated on the ventilator. Now, those are the things that just warmed my heart as I rounded uh, continually uh, during the pandemic surge. And, uh, and as Michelle stated, it was not just the clinical team. It's the, it's the environmental services team going in and, uh, and cleaning that room. They're, uh, they're doing those extra rounds to pick up PPE that's been disposed of 
you know, which is an enormous increase in the amount of work that they have to do. Uh, you know, the food service team delivering food at all hours of the night, uh, of the day and night, not just for patients, but for staff as well, as we tried to make this, the situation as, as good as it could be uh, for people that were going above and beyond. So, uh, you know, the, the, the gratifying piece of all of this to me was that after this, I'm convinced we could handle anything. You know, I'm convinced this, this team would do anything to support each other uh, and, to, and to get the necessary patient care done. And their courage, um, and, you know, to go into those rooms every day um, and, and do that kind of care was just, uh, just astounding. We had um, staff get sick, um, residents get sick. Luckily, we did not lose anyone, but there are healthcare workers across the country who died. Uh, in this pandemic, delivering that kind of care. So, um, you know, the, the the flyover that we had by the uh, Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds uh, to celebrate our healthcare heroes, um, just to, even those those little things that told our staff that they were appreciated, just meant so much. And um, so, so we're here. We're here to take care of the community. We'll always be here to take care of this community and these types of situations. And I can't thank uh, my team enough for doing what they did. And, uh, and it's great to be able to bring this message out uh, to the community uh, through this uh, podcast and other mechanisms as well. Absolutely incredible. Uh, Dan, Michelle, I want to extend my heartfelt thanks and appreciation for the extraordinary contributions that you've made to what I know our students and our academic uh, community are gonna find a very provocative and insightful conversation about the most important issue we're dealing with as a society uh, right now. Uh, but more importantly, I wanna thank you for your tremendous and valuable service uh, to the field. Um, you are why we created uh, the Watson School of Public Service, to really create the opportunity to make sure that we were addressing the leadership challenges and gaps uh, in the broader public service sector. And again, uh, the healthcare system is one critical element of that. So thank you again for your contribution to this sound studio. We look forward to continuing uh, conversations with you and hopefully we'll be able to have you back uh, to talk about uh, where we are uh, as a healthcare system and as a nation uh, as we uh, apply a lot of the lessons learned from COVID-19. So thank you very much for your service and look forward to seeing you both again soon. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Youngblood. We look forward to participating. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. From Thomas Edison State University, this is Edison Soundstage. <laughs>